and we're back. Hey, welcome everyone. What's up? Welcome to another Read Z Live. Uh, Read Z's ongoing series of webinars where we bring people from the world of uh, writing and publishing to uh, talk to us about well, writing and publishing. Uh, thank you all for joining today. It's uh, I know uh, here in the UK it's been quite a, a rainy one, so uh, what a what an ideal day to stay in and uh, have a warm evening and talk about writing. Uh, today I've got with me Jackson Dickett uh, from the Campfire Technologies team. Uh, he's someone we know through the world of uh, writing and publishing tech. Uh, he's an author as well in his own right. He's going to be coming on and talking to us a bit about writing and uh, his sort of unique perspective on the whole thing. Uh, yeah, well, in the meantime, uh, please do let us know where you're coming from. Uh, I'll read out and see where you're coming uh, to us from today. What a weird sentence. Uh, ooh, we've got... Uh, uh, Bobby from Kentucky, USA. Carolina Girl from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Chris Backman says, good afternoon. Rhonda from Tacoma, Washington. Welcome. Uh, welcome back. Uh, let me know if there's anyone new here today who hasn't uh, been to one of our Read Z Live webinars before. Uh, always happy to see new faces, but even more happy to see returning faces. Uh, and I do see quite a few of them uh, already here. Defuncoid here from Scotland. Fantastic. Pamela from Vancouver, BC. Uh, James from Chicago, Adrian from Southampton, uh, good mix of folks from uh, both sides of the pond and also further east uh, in India, I've seen uh, quite a few of you there. Well, thank you. Really appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. Uh, hopefully we'll get a lot out of this. It's always fantastic talking to writers, uh, especially ones who have a yeah, different approach. Uh, previously, we have a lot of editors on. Uh, today we have Jackson on, who's a writer. He also works with other writers as well. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of great stuff uh, that we're expecting. Brent from Albemarle, uh, North Carolina, first time attendee. Well, thank you. Natalia from Minsk, uh, Belarus, welcome. Iman from Egypt, uh, over in Cairo. Well, fantastic. We've got a, a wonderfully uh, international crowd. Uh, I, myself, uh, am based uh, here in North London, uh, where uh, some of our lockdown restrictions have recently been li uh, lifting a bit. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, but I uh, have been living here almost uh, too long now. But hey, we all love it. Uh, anyway, uh, for those of you just joining today, uh, we're having on uh, our guest Jackson Dickett from the uh, Campfire Technologies team. Uh, they sort of work in the writing tech space. I'm not sure what the official name for it is, but it's sort of like where Reed Z live as well. So uh, a lot of writing and publishing stuff that's sort of largely based online, but hey, what isn't based online these days? Hello to Jeremy from San Diego, California. Uh, Paolo from Dubai. Wynn from Calgary, Alberta. Fantastic. Ellie from England, UK. England, UK. That's sufficiently vague. Uh, Denise from Seattle. Well, so many great faces uh, and names turning up here. Uh, before we bring on our guest, I'm going to ask a, a bit of a cheeky favor. I know... We haven't done anything to earn it yet, but if you could give us a, a like, and uh, maybe even a subscribe, uh, that'll mean a, a lot to us. Uh, if you subscribe to the Read Z channel, you'll see lots of great stuff. Two times a week, uh, Shailin from our team puts out a new video talking about some sort of writing or publishing topic. Uh, I believe her most recent one was, uh, I think, three or four writing tips you don't really hear enough of. Uh, there's uh, a good module on editing that she's putting out in the month of May. Uh, so it's going to talk about self-editing and, uh, you know, working your way through the process of taking your first draft and polishing it until, you know, you have something good and substantial. So if you want that, uh, hit the subscribe button, 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 uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you'll see more good stuff. And of course, uh, you'll be the first to know whenever we have one of these Reedsy Lives, uh, these live webinars. Uh, Gomanda from Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. Uh, Siren Song from Toronto, Canada. Uh, we have uh, Pam also from Ontario. So many, so many Canadians love to see it. A lot of people from Ontario. Uh, if there's anyone from uh, other territories and the provinces, let me know. If anyone's from Saskatchewan, uh, give us a shout. Uh, Lyle from the UK. I'm Hayes. I'm Hayes. You're subscribed. Thank you very much. Exactly the kind of person we love to see here. Anyway. I see that it's now 8 o'clock uh, over here in the UK. It's going to be 3 p.m. on the East Coast, noon uh, on the West Coast. So uh, why don't we get this thing started? And uh, let me introduce our guest for today, Jackson. How are you doing? 
Hey, you doing all right? How about it yourself? Yeah, really, really good. Like, uh, you know, it's good to be indoors uh, on a rainy day. Uh, how is the uh, how's the weather in Tennessee? Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I saw Rachel Milligan said she was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So, hey, neighbor, wherever wherever you are, it's it's beautiful. Um, it, it's like warm. It's not humid, and it's windy, and that's like oh, it's perfect. Is that is that classic Tennessee? Because I've been to uh, Louisiana, and it was pretty muggy. It's it, it stays pretty hot. Um, in Knoxville, we're we're in a valley, so the the weather can change. 10 minutes to 10 minutes, it seems like. Nobody ever knows what's going to go on with the weather. You can just count on that you're going to have some killer allergies. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's allergy season right here. The uh, the trees are shedding their pollen, and uh, I've recently found another use for my COVID mask. Uh, I sleep in it now. Hooray. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I haven't had any allergy problems because I would just wear my mask everywhere. So there's that, I guess. Uh, but cool, I see that uh, we have... A bunch of folks pouring in. Good to see everyone. Uh, oh, Madhu has asked, uh, will we uh, take notes from this? Uh, as with all our Readsy Live presentations, I usually get a transcript done, which we edit and post on the Readsy blog uh, in the coming days. It takes a few days because uh, we need to usually edit it down because uh, otherwise it's just, it's just like bad dialogue where it just runs on forever. You kind of want to get to the good stuff. But they'll be organized and there'll be notes. And if you signed up through Eventbrite, you'll get an email about it. Otherwise, just head to blog.readsy.com slash live, and then you'll find uh, it'll turn up there in the next few days. Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to punish the people who've turned up early. In fact, uh, let's reward them. Why not? Uh, you okay with uh, getting a, getting a starts on this one? Yeah, ready to go. All right. If you need anything, uh, I'll, be, I'll be here uh, silently watching. Uh, and otherwise, I'll see you at the end of the Q&A. All righty. Sounds like a plan. All righty. So, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming. And thank you to Reedsy for having me on. My name is Jackson Dicker, and I'm an author. My debut novel is actually coming out in June. So, I don't know. Maybe I can't say I'm an author yet, but it's it's coming. Um, I'm a chief marketing officer at Campfire Technology, and we sell software for creative writers. I also have ADHD. So for those who don't know, ADHD is a chronic mental condition that encompasses attention difficulty, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness. Um, so a lot of people have also heard of ADD, and that's ADHD too, kind of. They were morphed into one big spectrum called ADHD a few years ago. Um, so it's important to note. Oh, wait. It's my, oh, okay. My face is covering the, okay, never mind. We're good. Um, they were morphed into one big spectrum called ADHD a few, a few years ago. So um, if you have ADHD, we may actually not have the same symptoms just because there's a, there's a pretty big, um, pretty big array, I guess. Um, there's a lot of potential symptoms uh, since attention difficulty, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness covers a lot of, a lot of ground. So I'm constantly learning new things about ADHD, but the big thing is that ADHD makes it harder to do things that normal people can do. Um, like repetitive mundane tasks can be really difficult for people with ADHD. Like nobody likes doing chores, like unloading the dishes or doing the laundry. But for people with ADHD, it kind of goes a little bit further than that. It's truly difficult for us to accomplish simple tasks like this. Um, so you can imagine how difficult a task like sitting down and focusing on writing for an hour at a time can be difficult too. Um, so that, but that's a problem that a lot of writers have. So hopefully some of my kind of coping strategies will help both the ADHD brains that are here and the non ADHD brains learn some new strategies, um, to apply to their writing. Um, also right at the top, I just wanted to say that all writing advice is complete garbage. There's nothing that works for everybody. There's no such thing as universal good writing advice, in my opinion. So something that works well for me might not work well for you and vice versa. So if I bring up something um, that you can apply to your writing that doesn't work for you, I invite you to ignore me until I get to my next point. So without further ado, um, let's get started talking about planning complex stories and what you can learn from an ADHD writer. So we're gonna be going over how to organize your plot into a story, uh, sustaining suspense, some ADHD coping mechanisms for writers, and then 10 practical writing tips to help you get words on the page. Okay, so how to organize your plot into a story. That's easy. You think of a plot that takes up 85,000 words 
decide on relevant themes, figure out how characters will change or not change, weave in some subplots, ulterior motives, lies, love, and mysteries. You set up promises to the reader throughout the story and you pay off those promises in a satisfying way. Done, easy, right? So let's start by figuring out our plot type. That seems like something a new writer might do, right? A new writer might sit down and Google types of plots, pick one, and work from there. When you Google plot types, one of the first few results is 1,462 basic plot types from dailywritingtips.com. So here's all the ones they listed on that page that I visited. If you're a new writer and this is the first thing you come across, you're going to be totally lost. And these are just the basic types? Sure. Murderous Adultery is pretty straightforward, and that's a book that I'd absolutely read. But I have no idea what enmity of kinsmen means, and if you do, please keep your enmity to yourself. But here in front of us, we have 69 supposedly basic plot types to choose from to create a story out of. So how is this helpful? It's not. It's not helpful. It's information overload. You're going to get overwhelmed. Um, you're not going to know what to do with this information, and it raises, it's, it's like gatekeeping for writers. Figuring out your plot type isn't a prerequisite to your writing. It's not required, and oftentimes it won't help you in that moment where you're trying to sit down and figure out what story you're going to tell. In the moment, this is an overwhelming rabbit hole. Now, don't get me wrong. Knowledge about plot types is helpful for experienced writers. The more you know about stories and their structure, the more you can subconsciously apply as you outline. But most writers don't start with figuring out their plot type. They generally just start by writing. So what do you write then? You want to start with your idea. Your idea is the plot. The story is what happens when characters experience the plot. And that's the part that you want to focus on. You don't need to know your plot type or your themes or common tropes. That's all second draft stuff to polish your story within its genre. First, find your conflict and find your characters. Conflict needs to be interesting, unique, and challenging relative to your character. So for a space pirate who's fighting off eldritch space gods, um, that might be a normal day. For a suburban mom, getting the kids to soccer by six is a normal day. If you flip those characters and their conflicts, things get a lot more interesting. Once your space pirate is put into the role of a suburban mom, the problem becomes a lot more challenging for them. Though very capable of it, most suburban moms don't know how to fight off eldritch space aliens. In the same vein, most pirates in the same vein, most space pirates don't know the first thing about the most formidable creatures in the galaxy, which is children hyped up on Mountain Dew. All the parents know that. Your conflict and how interesting it is relies on your character. I don't know about you, but I'd love to read the story about the underdog soccer mom fighting off Eldritch space aliens. It's interesting, unique, and the problem is challenging, relevant to her. This is why characters like Superman are generally tricky characters to write about. He's invincible, overpowered for 99% of conflicts. Um, so if you want to write on easy mode, just make sure that your characters have weakness. It'll make the story more interesting, more unique, and your character's trials more challenging, which is going to be more stimulating for the reader. But is your conflict good enough to last hundreds of pages? Yes, absolutely, always. As long as your characters are dynamic enough to support it, your conflict is never too small. Not to mention that along the way, there's usually going to be new conflicts that arise throughout the story. They don't always have to be saving the world the entire way through. Sometimes saving the world starts with saving your neighborhood in chapter one or saving, you know, your friends from burning building in chapter five. Meet Stephen King. He's a relatively unknown self-published indie writer, but I think he's got some great ideas. Here's a quote from him. Put interesting characters in difficult situations and write to find out what happens. Now, every writer in the world likes to quote Stephen King we all take his advice for scripture because let's face it, it's pretty damn good advice. So let's dissect some Stephen King novel ideas really quick just to prove my point because it never hurts to take pointers from the king, right? So a dog attacks. That book is 300 pages long and it's called Cujo. In Cujo, a dog with rabies terrorizes a town. 
the conflict is interesting because many people have dogs. The conflict is unique because dogs don't usually attack people. And the conflict is challenging because a regular woman and her child are stuck in a bad situation against the dog. By the way, that's not a picture of Cujo. That's my dog, Gilmo. Let's take a look at another story. After his accident, a writer is taken in by a crazy woman. That book is over 400 pages long. It's called Misery. And in Misery, the conflict is interesting and unique just from the premise alone. Though in order to make it challenging relative to the protagonist, the protagonist had to be bedridden and the antagonist was almost supernaturally strong. Let's take a look at another one. A bullied girl gets superpowers. That book is 200 pages long. King loves putting ordinary people in unusual positions. It inherently makes the story interesting by making the main character an underdog. The unusual position they're put in is usually unique. And as an underdog, the character is at a challenging disadvantage. Consider for a moment all the different directions you could go with this plot, depending on the character. In Carrie, she seeks vengeance against her bullies. How would the story change with a few tweaks? She could move to a new city and grapple with her identity and what the powers mean for her identity. It's the same plot, same conflict, but because of the character's decision, we have a John Green novel instead of a Stephen King novel. <clears throat> Let's take a look at one more story by Stephen King. A sewer clown terrorizes children. That book is ele over 1,100 pages long. He wrote over 1,000 pages about a sewer clown terrorizing children. This book is proof that as long as the conflict is interesting, unique, and challenging, relevant to your characters, then any plot can work. So how do you organize your plot into a story? You think of a problem that's interesting, unique, and challenging. You create a character who is most poorly equipped to deal with the problem, and then you write. Um, but there's a lot more stuff between the, the, the beginning and the end. One big thing to think about though, is you need to figure out what works for you. As a writer, you get a lot of advice and something that works beautifully for me might work terribly for you. If plotting three act structures is your thing, then great, do that. Personally, I'm big on pantsing. But at the end of the day, organizing your plot or your conflict and story idea into a story isn't too hard. Characters go from point A to point B. They grow and learn or they don't and regress. Stuff changes or it stays the same. Short stories do this with very few pages and they do it really well. But when you're writing a novel, you have to turn the plot into a story with a much bigger word count. So how do you do that? How do you, how do, you do all this stuff between the beginning and the end? With good pacing and by sustaining suspense. So now we're gonna talk about sustaining suspense. So what is suspense? Well, if we're talking about the unknown that happened in the past, that's mystery. The unknown happening in the present is intrigue and the unknown in the future, that's suspense. You can have a story with no intrigue. You can have a story with very few questions about the past, but we usually don't read to discover something about the past. We read to answer questions about the future or to dispel the suspense. Even stories where we are trying to discover something about the past, we're doing it to dis dispel the suspense in the future. So if a story follows a murder investigation, we have a lot of questions about what happens in the past, but inherently that story is going to have a lot of intrigue about the present, where the protagonist is presently trying to catch the killer and might be in danger. That story has a lot of suspense because the well-being of the investigator, maybe the victim's family, and the safety of the general public relies on solving the murder mystery. Suspense is all about the unknown, but you need to have some but you need to have some hints sprinkled in. The reader needs to have an idea about what could happen. Their imagination is your best friend here. Be sure to drop hints about what could happen or what will happen to ramp up the suspense. If the reader has no idea what happens next, that's not suspense. And if there's only one thing that can happen, it's not much of a question or a mystery. And consequently, there's not much suspense. So what's the best way to ramp up sus suspense? One of my favorites is just by promising the reader what's coming. In the first sentence of Private by James Patterson, he promises at least two deaths to the main character. The quote goes like this. 
To the best of my understandably shaky recollection, the first time I died, it went something like this. It's a fantastic first line that sets up suspense and makes promises on what the reader can expect. Not only is your protagonist going to die once, they're going to die at least twice. One need can also help a lot because it makes the reader anxious about the future, and that's suspense. Will the character get what they want or what they need at the end of the book? Establish the character's wants and needs early on to make us wonder and let our imaginations do the work for you. You don't need to pose the question in the book. Just showing us the character's hopes and dreams is enough to create stakes. Choice is also great for suspense. If you have a choice between two equally balanced options, it's going to create suspense. Especially if both options seem likely to the reader, the more the better. A great example of this is which guy will she pick in romance novels. I also recommend using dramatic irony whenever you know it's appropriate for your story. Um, if you don't know, this is when the reader has knowledge of something and characters don't. So for instance, if you have a character named Levi who finds his long lost father and gets a job at the same bar as him, then the book switches point of view to the father. It makes all of their interactions much more suspenseful because we know that Levi is his long lost son but our main character doesn't know that. And then structure is great to play around with for suspense too. Um, an example of how you can play with structure is with the story starting later and then backtracking. If you've ever seen Breaking Bad, the opening is a great example of this. Or um, if you haven't seen The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix, it's a fantastic example of how you can use structure to create a sense of mystery, suspense, and uncertainty by using flashbacks. And actually, um, flashbacks are really called analepsis. And a flash forward or a glimpse into the future is called prolepsis. So the more you know, I might have just helped you out on, on trivia night when the world opens back up. Now, let's talk a little bit about stakes. Wrong stakes. That's my bad. Sorry. I made this when I was hungry. Now, stakes make us invested in characters they inherently create suspense as well. So stakes make us wonder things like, does the character get what they want or not? When you have a character that we care about, make that character trying to do something. Now, I can't be the only one who's ever stared at ants while they work before, right? Like imagine an ant trying to haul a giant crumb back to his home. And because we're weirdo writers, let's imagine that this ant told his friends he was going to come back with the biggest crumb ever. So the ant is the protagonist. It's trying to do a hard thing. And right off the bat, readers like seeing characters who are trying to do a hard thing. You can't help but be totally sucked into its plight. You'll spend a good 10 minutes totally enthralled and staring at this ant as it treks across your kitchen floor. You want to know, does the ant make it across the room with the giant crumb or not? This is a great example of a combination of stakes and suspense. From the beginning of the story, we know it's at stake. The ant's life, the well-being of the rest of the colony, and the ant's reputation is on the line here. Now, because we're writing fiction, let's imagine that you own a chameleon that loves eating ants. And you remember it's roaming free in your house. You panic and look everywhere for it. But since it's a chameleon, you can't find it. Realizing the best way you can help the ant is by staying by its side, you dash back to the kitchen. We instantly fear the worst for the ant. Not only does it have to carry this massive crumb across the room, but it has to do so against a giant, camouflaged super predator. Back in the kitchen, you see a note from your husband. It says, ran to the store. We're out of chameleon food. And then at that moment, you spot the chameleon. It's making its way to the ant. Boom. The chapter ends. So what's at stake? The ant's life, the well-being of the colony, and the ant's honor. We stated that at the beginning of the story. We care about the ant because he's the underdog. He's carrying a giant crumb to take care of his family. So the reader cares about the ant. We remember that we have a free roaming chameleon in the house, which makes us worry for the ant's safety and makes them fear the worst. And then we find a note from our husband. It says we're out of chameleon food. This is a great detail because it might mean the chameleon has been fed 
or it might mean that it's completely ravenous. It hasn't eaten in a while. We don't get to know. Give the reader a little bit of info about something and leave all the rest to their imagination. Suggest something and let them figure it out. Sure, maybe the chameleon was fed, but does that mean he can't go for a nice little snack? You'll have to read and find out. The suspense about what could happen is the reader's reason to read the next chapter. So we're going to go through just a couple of quick tips um, for suspense. It, in order, um, you're going to want to continue creating tension for the future throughout your payoffs. So as you pay things off, you're going to create more problems and build up to more um, reveals. Damned if you do, damned if you don't decisions are also really great for suspense because no matter what your character chooses, it's going to be bad. Time limits are also stressful for the reader because they're constantly aware of them. Um, and that's a good thing. You, you want the reader to be stressed and anxious about the time limit because that means they're invested. When it comes to withholding info, you don't want to withhold superficial information like names or genders. You want to be very purposeful on what you withhold to make the reader perk up and pay attention. They'll notice. The readers, readers are smart and they pick up on stuff. They're going to wonder why you withheld that information. Now, to when it comes to uncertainty, to write uncertainty, there must be some things that readers know with absolute certainty to make them be able to appreciate the uncertainty. So you want to aim for a frustration balance in the reader, if that makes sense. They should be interested to find out the withheld information, but not so much that they get frustrated. And then surprises. Twists are all about characters. It's not so much about tricking the reader or the surprise itself as it is about how the characters feel about it. If there's a huge twist, but the character is unsurprised, it's going to diminish the impact. The reader's emotions are going to mimic the protagonist. If the protagonist is sad, your reader might be too. Um, if your character is angry about the twist, it'll heighten the way your reader feels about it. The most important thing to remember when it comes to suspense is that it's a juggling act. We're constantly throwing balls up into the air and making promises to the reader, but at some point we have to catch them when they come down. Otherwise, we have an unsatisfying story. Now that we've gotten through some of some of the you know tough writing tips up front, I wanted to take some time time to talk about um, some of the ADHD coping mechanisms that uh, I personally recommend. They help me kind of fight through my mental fog and executive dysfunction. So if they can help somebody with ADHD, I figure they might be able to help some, um, some normal brains out there. So people with ADHD are infamous for getting distracted. And let's be honest, so are most writers. ADHD brains are drawn to the most stimulating thing in the room. That could be the TV, your phone, the new tab button on your browser that leads you to YouTube. And sometimes it's people. The best cure for distractions is boundaries. Boundaries with yourself and with other people. Before I even sit down to write, I give my family a heads up I'm going to be writing and set boundaries with them. This way I can go ahead and help them with anything they need before I get in the zone. Because goodness knows if I get distracted while I'm in the zone, it's going to be much harder for me to get started again. Once I get started, I have to I have to stay in the zone. If I get distracted, it's, it breaks the spell. It's all over. Next, I pick my writing spot. Um, it might be cliche, but my favorite place to write is in coffee shops. I like the ambient noise, the people around. And seeing other people working helps me stay focused on my work. I also like to turn on music that I've heard like a million times and know all the lyrics to. That way, I'm less likely to get distracted by noise or eavesdropping on somebody else's conversation. People with ADHD also have the ability to hyper-focus on things <laughs> really well. My first novel, which, shameless plug, comes out June 1st. It's called Quest for the Golden Plunger. is about 80,000 words long. There was a day I sat down and wrote 7,000 words in one day. It was crazy. I sat down, got in the zone, and started writing. I didn't stop to eat or go to the bathroom, which, which is unhealthy. I didn't mean to. That's just how focused I was. I wrote over a tenth of my novel in one day. Pretty wild. 
I like to compare this hyper focus to the flow state. The flow state is a fascinating sports psychology term for getting in the zone. I can't cover it all right now, but here's the basics. The flow state is an almost trance-like state that athletes and performers of all kinds get into. And writers, when we sit down to write, is a type of performance. The flow state is when your brain turns off, you know what to do, and you get it done. It occurs when you have a high level of perceived skill in a task, and the task you're about to take on is a high level of challenge. If you're interested in reading more about it, I definitely recommend checking out the book, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. Delayed task initiation is another major symptom of ADHD, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You want to do something, and you just can't. It's also known as executive dysfunction. This should sound pretty familiar to most writers. You want to write, and then you don't. You do anything else. You get a snack, you check Twitter, whatever it is. I love timers and the Pomodoro technique here. Uh, the Pomodoro technique is you give yourself five minutes to delay, delay, delay to your heart's content. Scroll through Twitter, watch videos, do whatever for five minutes. But when that timer goes off and your five minutes are up, set that timer for 25 minutes and you get to work. And then after that 25 minutes, you get to take another five minute break. It really helps um, when if I'm having trouble like focusing and staying focused, my brain keeps wanting to be elsewhere. Um, it just depends on, on what my brain's doing that day, I guess. Whether I like to do that or, or kind of hyper focus. Because the flow state, you, you can't get into the flow state every time you, you try to do it. it it's, it's not magical or, or mystical, you know, that things kind of, it, you have to have a high level of perceived skill and a high level of difficulty at the challenge. So, um, you know, if, if that day writing's coming easy to you, it, you might have a harder time entering the flow state. My next tip would be to give yourself a deadline. If you're a writer and you're struggling to get words on the page, create a deadline. It could be that if you hit your deadline, you reward yourself with that thing that's been sitting in your Amazon shopping cart, or maybe you join a writing group to hold yourself accountable. Or my personal favorite, announce to the world that you have a certain word count you're going to hit by a certain time period on social media. Make peer pressure work for you. You don't want to let your friends down or miss the deadline you told the world, so you'll work your butt off to hit it. And the best thing for a writer with or without ADHD is a deadline. You'll be amazed at how much work you get done. People, actually, before I get to this next point, I'm going to take a quick drink of water. So it's no secret that people with ADHD have brains that work a little bit differently. Um, but dopamine levels may be at the heart of it. Dopamine is a hormone in the brain that's responsible for feelings of reward and pleasure. And studies have found that people with ADHD who don't have the same levels of dopamine as regular people. So whereas most people get a nice little bump of dopamine whenever they complete a task like doing the laundry or, you know, one of those chores we talked about earlier, it can be harder for people um, with ADHD to get that dopamine bump. We have to hack our brains to get that dopamine bump with things like small rewards for completing tasks or creating lists and checking things off, which is so satisfying. Some people think that it sounds kind of silly, but um, things like sticker charts work really well uh, for people with ADHD. It's not just for children. It's not immature. It's very satisfying to be able to look at something and visually see, I have accomplished this. So we have covered a ton of ground on this slide alone, but on to the last bullet point, which is organization. People with ADHD and most writers are terrible about organization. I used to leave notes about my writing everywhere on scraps of paper, the notes app on my phone, et cetera. And as a result, my writing always came out disorganized or I found myself wasting time looking for information that I didn't have filed away correctly. So what's the solution here? Better organization. And for this, you'll have to find what works for you. Personally, I prefer writing software and there's a lot of excellent free options out there. If you've got the patience for it, you can create your own story Bible with something as simple as Google Docs, um, Microsoft Word, Excel, anything like that. Just however you decide to organize, promise me that you have your work backed up so you don't lose it when the cat decides to knock your computer off the table because it's going to happen. 
but organization can be a pain in the moment, um, but it absolutely pays off. There's nothing worse than getting to chapter 11 of your story and not being able to remember minute details about the way a character looks. Um, good organization will always help you write better stories faster. Um, yeah, it, it just sucks to waste time on that kind of thing. So on to the last, last point. Um, 10 practical writing tips to get words on the page. I'll try to go through these kind of quick because I know we're I know we're moving slow on time. <clears throat> so the first one is to tell yourself a story. That's it. That's all you're doing. Don't overcomplicate things with those plot types we talked about earlier or off the walls outlining unless that kind of thing helps you. But if you are an outliner, then make sure in your outline that you aren't telling yourself a crappy version of the story. That's going to lead to a lot of problems for you to fix in the next draft. Um, inciting incidents should be the things that carry us all the way through the book. Think of them like a crisis or a huge problem to solve. Someone's death as an inciting incident is usually tough to make work. Death in many stories isn't a problem to solve. How do you solve someone's death? You can't. Since many people grieve the same way, it might be very challenging to pull off, though this doesn't always apply the same to horror, sci-fi, or fantasy. But again, there's no rules when it comes to writing. Don't be afraid to be explicit about exactly what the problem is or be afraid about being too heavy-handed in your manuscript as to what the obstacle actually is in your story. That'll get ironed out. In the first draft, write exactly what the problem is as a thesis statement if you're having trouble. It can help you with the middle and the end, being able to reference exactly what is causing these problems and pulling us through your plot. Just make sure you're thinking critical about critically about your obstacle. You'd never want your reader to think, well, why didn't they just do X, Y, Z? If you have that thought, then the reader will too. So explain why your characters can't do it. Uh, the next tip is to make awful things happen to your character so your reader can see what they're made of. Disney movies are scary sometimes, but they still end up happy at the end. Happy stories still need problems, and the characters should suffer somewhat until the end. Think of your novel as the interesting part of someone's life. Their crisis is unsolvable for a long time, and terrible things keep happening to them, which makes it interesting. You should constantly be thinking about what else could happen. What else can you throw at them? Now, do you remember that indie writer from earlier, Stephen King? He recommends that you write the first draft in three months and be done. Well, that must be nice for him, but I have a life. It's tough to write a novel in three months. Time is a luxury that many people don't have, but he's right. You should finish that rough draft as fast as possible. Don't worry if it sucks. You'll fix it in the second draft. All right, the last five tips. So if you get stuck while you're writing, um, a great thing to do to get through that writer's block is to add new characters. Both people the main character knows and doesn't know. New characters are great because it shows more about the world, like if they're boring or eccentric or how they contrast with current characters. New characters often mirror something in main characters, so that's something to keep in mind, along with to consider the power dynamics about when a new character shows up. There's always a power dynamic between characters at play, so you need to consider all these different facets and how they can help you get through your writer's block, which... A lot of times, writer's block just means that your conflict isn't big enough because your character should always have a problem to solve. When that new character shows up, though, give them a distinct physical feature to remember them by. Neil Gaiman refers to this idea as giving your characters funny hats. It doesn't just have to be physical, though. You can give them a word they repeat a lot or a phrase so you have a quick and easy mental picture of them. Like a character who says, bro is instantly going to conjure a different image than a character who says, hey, kid. <clears throat> um, an easy way to make your character more interesting is by putting them through something where any normal person would decide to change, and then they refuse. Character arcs are satisfying when done right, without a doubt, but characters don't always have to change. Homer Simpson never changes. There isn't always a lesson. Most of the time when characters change, it's because they've been through a lot or if a character has more or less power at the end of the novel compared to the way they started, they're usually changed. Um, the ninth tip is that Brandon Sanderson has something called the rule of cool. Basically, when in doubt, put cool stuff in your book. 
even if it doesn't make sense. The kind of stuff that people who read it will totally nerd out over. At the end of the day, this is your novel. Have fun with it and put in stuff that you think is cool, even if you have to work it in more in the second draft to make it make sense. You'll also be more excited about writing it. And uh, like I said, there's no rules, so do what you want. And then number 10, read books. We all know that reading books will make you a better writer, but I actually mean literal physical copies of books. Um, of the things, books that of the things that you need to know and learn about to write your novel. I know you can use the internet to research, but it's too easy to get distracted on the internet. It's not good for creative brains the way physical books are. The internet will overstimulate you, and writers have their best breakthroughs when they're understimulated. So highly recommend you get a physical book, and I guarantee you'll get more writing done that way. And you'll spend less time on YouTube watching cat videos. Really quick, I just wanted to plug um, Campfire Blaze, which is, um, like I said, I'm from Campfire Technology. Um, and we created Campfire Blaze, which is a writing software to help writers stay organized. It's got all kinds of things from a word processor to write your story in, story Bibles, character profiles, timelines. And we store everything in the cloud with Google servers so you know it's safe. Um, the plans start as low as 50 cents a month because we're a bunch of guys straight out of college. So we wanted to make this affordable and it's actually free for smaller projects. You can use the coupon code there, readz 21 to receive 20% off all lifetime purchases in 2021. So you can either choose a subscription or a lifetime purchase, which is cool. And then a shameless self promo for myself. That's my book right there. The quest for the golden plunger. You can pre-order it on Amazon, uh, it comes out June 1st. Um, and then I've got my website and my Twitter right there for you to check out as well. So um, thank you guys so much for for having me. And sorry if I ran a little bit long and got a little rambly there, but uh, hopefully everybody really enjoyed. No, that's amazing. I've been uh, tracking the comments uh, throughout this entire thing. So many people, uh, so many writers who also have HD, ADHD who found this like, you know, incredibly validating and useful. I think it's one of these things that people are starting to realize is probably more prevalent uh, than you know was assumed before, uh, and yeah, I think yeah, a lot of this stuff has been amazing advice for all sorts of writers. Um, everyone, uh, Jackson's going to stick around for a bit and uh, answer some questions. So, if you have any questions, uh, there's a live chat box in uh, YouTube. However, you're seeing it right now. Uh, drop a question in there, and uh, we'll bring them up uh, on here for Jackson to answer. Uh, apart from that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you've been worried that uh, there's so much information here, you don't know how you're going to retain it all. Don't worry, if you just go to blog.readz.com slash live, I'm going to have a transcript up there in a few days with uh, all the points that Jackson's covered in this. Uh, so yeah, should be great. But yeah, of course, uh, send in any uh, questions you have and uh, we'll bring this up. Well, right now, it's only just praise. Might as well <clears throat> put this up all the way to I know. I was going to say, thank you so much, everybody. You guys are seriously uh, too kind. I'm blown away. Thank you guys so much. I, I really appreciate it, and I'm glad that everybody enjoyed. Yeah, there was a uh, right in the middle. People were very curious uh, as to what happened to the ant. It's probably best that we never know, right? To, to what? To the ant. Oh, yeah. It's best that you never know. Remember what I said, leave the readers wondering at the at the end of the chapter, right? That way you'll you'll you have to read and find out. Although I, I don't ha admittedly, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have the ending written. So I challenge you to write to write the end for me. All right. I've got a question here from Kat. Uh, could you expand on your point six uh, obstacles? Let me let me back up and check um, point six obstacles. I think it was probably in the suspense bit. Was it in the suspense bit? Let me back up really quick. Oh, was it point number three on the practical writing tips, obstacles? Probably. Um, my point there is just to um, really be sure that you're explicit about what your obstacle is when you're writing. So a lot of people, they'll start writing a story and they've got their big inciting incident, their big problem. Um, and they'll kind of lose track of it along the way. So if you're having trouble getting across to the reader exactly what your problem is, be explicit about it. Um, be heavy handed in your first draft and you'll iron that out in your second draft um, just by saying, hey, reader, here's the problem. We have to go from point A to point B, right? Like a typical, um, maybe like hero's journey story. You can just outright say that 
and absolutely it'll help you while you're writing um, stay on target, I guess. Cool. Uh, Sarah L has the question. Uh, she says, thank you for the ADHD advice. I'm wondering if there is a way to control hyperfocus. Yeah. So I guess when it comes to controlling hyperfocus, there's kind of, it's kind of two facets here. Like how do you get hyperfocused? And then how do you, how do you make sure, like, like I said, my story where, I mean, I was, um, I was, I, I, like I said, I skipped a couple meals that day and I, I didn't get up to go to the bathroom. So I just, it, it's like time traveling. Um, so to, to make sure that you don't do that and you remember to eat and go to the bathroom and, and, you know, be a normal human, uh, definitely set an alarm. You know, if, if, if you have an hour to go set an alarm and then at the end of your hour, your alarm will go off as far as getting into hyperfocus, that kind of refers just more to setting those boundaries that we talked about, making sure um, that your environment and the people around you are going to be respectful of your writing time, um, respectful of you um, and making that happen. So definitely like I, I, cause I like to write on my laptop if I, that in a coffee shop, because on my laptop, there's no video games, you know, it's less fun to watch. Uh, um, <laughs> it's less fun to watch videos and things like that versus on my desktop. It's a little bit harder to write for me. Uh, a few people have been asking to uh, asked here about a rundown of the 10 steps. Don't worry. Just go to blog.readz.com slash live in a few days. All the points will be there. No need to uh, go back over here. But if you do want to watch this again, right at this link, you can rewatch this entire presentation uh, at any time uh, until the heat death of the universe or when YouTube closes down, whichever comes first. Uh, okay. Uh, Sally's asked for the coupon code. Uh, I've pinned it to the top of the uh, comments there, so you should be able to find it. Uh, I believe it is readz21. Uh, GP Legacy says, awesome as a speaker indeed. Ah, thank you I'm, so much. I'm struggling to find questions uh, amidst all the kudos. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, you said the outliners should be sure they have the best version <clears throat> of the story first. Can you elaborate? So when you when you're telling yourself um, in your outline, you don't want to just put like one sentence for each chapter, right? Because that's telling yourself a crappy version of your story. If just in that um, point for that chapter, you say, "Okay, well, um, the ant finds the crumb," right? If you, if you've got a whole chapter about that encompassing ten pages, that's not very specific, and you're not doing yourself a ton of favors in that outline. So the point is, if you tell yourself a crappy story without enough details, without enough um, like nuance and, and things going on, then you're going to have a much harder time um, in the revision because you're going to need a lot more edits, if that makes sense. I don't know if I made sense, but I tried. That makes sense. Uh, Armand uh, has a question uh, that I know is near and dear to you. Do you think it's better to be a plotter or a panther uh, for someone with ADHD? Personally, I think both are great and, you know, there's no such thing as better because it's whatever works for you. That's not a cop out answer. But my personal um, preference is pantsing. I really like pantsing just because for me, as I'm if I if I sit down and I plot the entire thing, it feels like I've already told myself the story. I know Stephen King touches on this a lot and um, on writing um, where he feels like if he outlines the whole thing, then it's just not as fun. And that's that's at the core of it for me. Um, but I do think, you know, us pantsers, we have a lot more work to do in the second draft without a doubt. It's brutal. The edit, uh, Lucy has a question here. Do you have any advice about balancing, uh, multiple viewpoints in a story, uh, especially when it comes to suspense stakes and st uh, tension? Yeah. So actually the, the, the manuscript I'm working on right now is, um, from two different viewpoints. And the number one thing I'd make sure that you do is end each chapter on a cliffhanger or something interesting or sinister is about to happen. Um, you know, make us fear the worst, um, just like we fear the worst for that ant there at the end, um, at the end of every single chapter. Every, you know, if, if it's not every single chapter, that's okay. But even as a reader, it's the best thing ever when you get to the end of the chapter and you know, you're like, Oh my gosh, what happens next? You turn the page and it's like, Oh, this guy, I don't want, I don't care what this guy's doing, but you have to read what that guy's doing. It's going to make them read that next chapter really fast, even though they're already up late just to get to the next chapter and find out what happened. Yeah. I find that with, uh, 
the Game of Thrones books as well. They're like, certain characters I care a little bit less than the others, and like I just kind of like grin and bear it through those uh, just to get back to you know like a Tyrion one. Uh, okay, ooh, here's a question from Hania. Uh, what to do in the marathon of the middle when you're stuck in the middle? Stuck in the middle, I so I definitely say for one thing, adding new characters is always great. Characters, new characters can pop in anytime. They can be old characters that your protagonist knows and the reader doesn't, or they can be brand new people. Um, but ultimately, your problem needs to be big. That obstacle, the conflict, whatever it is, it needs to be big enough to get you through that sticky middle. Or um, you can kind of do more of a serial thing where if you realize you're halfway through and you're, uh, you realize your conflict's not big enough, throw another problem in there. Let's throw some more fuel on the fire because the, the more problems you have, the less you're going to get stuck in the middle. Um, if you're stuck, your problem's not big enough. Um, so add more, you know, maybe, you know, if, if your conflict is, um, I don't know, the dog ran away and then they find the dog. Well, somebody else had found the dog and was feeding the dog and they're claiming to have owned it now, right? So even if your problem is solved, figure out how you can make a problem out of the problem being solved. And that could help you get through that middle. I think, yeah, one of the great storytelling lessons from Breaking Bad is that each episode seems to be Walt gets himself into a terrible solution, finds an ingenious solution. And as a result, that solution puts him in a worse position than before. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Up. Uh, Ooh, here's a controversial one. Isidia asks, uh, can, or maybe should, ADHD writers use negative reinforcement to hack the brain? I wouldn't recommend using negative reinforcement just because, um, well, I mean, I guess you could. Um, it really, At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's whatever works for you. I The way I've always done it is I've always um, done positive reinforcement, though, um, I mean, I guess you could use that negative uh, reinforcement as well, well. I guess like the promise of shame when you you know keep yourself accountable online, that is in some way negative. But, you know, you're not exactly flagellating yourself for not hitting. Your <gasps> oh, goals. well, OK, so I, I might be I might be too in the weeds here. In psychology, you have uh, positive reinforcement negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. So there's like four different categories to go through. So uh, I'm not sure which one they're referring to. But um, you definitely, like, if, if you do mean it in the negative, um, you can, like, that peer pressure, like what I was talking about, I absolutely do that. I My word count is, is public in my Twitter bio, um, and I'm behind right now. So everybody in the comments can shake their finger at me. <laughs> uh and we'll just do one more before we wrap up. Here's from Isabel. Uh, Isabella, sorry. Uh, do you have any advice for teenagers with ADHD who are busy but want to write a novel? Yeah, so not everybody has all the time in the world to write a novel or even sit down, but everybody has time to sit down and write whatever it is, whatever a, a, you know, a solid word count goal for the day is, right? So for some people, um, sitting down, like Stephen King. We'll talk about Stephen King some more. Stephen King has uh, said before, you know, he'll spend the whole day writing. And if he gets one solid paragraph, he's thrilled. All right. So that, that's like his bar. Um, so I challenge you to find any amount of time. Right. Because if, if uh, you're a teenager, you're in school, you've got 15 minutes between classes. I know you do. I, w I, I did that just not too long ago. Um, you, that's time to write. And even if you, even if in that 10 minutes where you're sitting there waiting for class to start, instead of scrolling through social media, um, in that 10 minutes, if you get 20 words down, you know, if you do that five times between all five of your classes every day, that it's going to add up. And um, eventually, it doesn't take too many words a day to have a novel in a year. I mean, what, if you wrote... 500 words a day. Um, I mean, that's a decent amount, but that, that'd be, uh, how many that, that'd be about two novels a year, I think. So if you wrote two, challenge yourself to write 250 words a day and you'll have about a novel in a year. That's there you go, Isabella. That's for you. Cool. Thank you everyone for asking your questions. Uh, we're about to wrap things up, but if you're still here, please do, uh, consider hard, uh, and give us a thumbs up uh, and like this video. And of course, subscribe. Uh, Jackson, you guys uh, have a YouTube channel as well, right? Yes, we do. It's called um, Around the Campfire on YouTube. Actually, um, I can link to it in the chat. Well, actually, I don't think I can. But um, 
it, it's a, a bunch of video essays for for writers where we we talk about tons of stuff along these lines. I, I help um, write and edit them, but Levi does a fantastic job. If if I send you a link really quick, am I able to throw uh, that in the yeah. chat? Yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll search for it and post it in. Uh, okay, that'd be great. Yeah, so it's um, all video essays. We do usually like one a month ish. Um, we used to do two a month, but uh, we've we've been given Levi all kinds of other projects to do. Um, but uh, if if you enjoy these readsy live chats, I, I definitely think um, you'll you'll find a lot of value in the videos on the Around the Campfire channel. <clears throat> cool. Uh, I've dropped that in the chat. There's a delay on this, so it'll turn up in the future, probably in 20 seconds. Oh, no um, worries. But cool. As I mentioned before, we're going to have the transcript for this available in a few days. Uh, so if you ha haven't signed up, just head to blog.readsy.com slash live. You can see our full archive uh, of webinars going back to 2016, I think now, uh, on just about any topic you can imagine. Uh, of course, give us a subscribe here. We've got new videos every single week. Jackson, I want to thank you so much uh, this is really fantastic. We'd love to have you on again at some point. Uh, oh, absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. Seriously, you guys are, are very kind. And I, I really appreciate all the, all the kind words. And thank you to everybody who's subscribing to the YouTube as well. Great. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. If you're in India right now, stay safe, stay at home. And uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. All right. Bye.